Hi, my name is Dorothy Drew. This is a, a video commentary on a book called The Blue Castle. My friend Diane encouraged me to read this novel by Lucy Maud Montgomery. It was published in 1926 because she said it was so relevant to the work that I do to help clients release pain, to cope better with the issues in their life. And I was a bit skeptical. How could a children's author from so long ago be something that my clients might relate to? So she gave me a summary of the book, enough that I was convinced to read the book. The Blue Castle is a great summer read. It's relevant if you have a lot of childhood issues to overcome. I'd like to share some of the comments about this book, especially to encourage anyone stuck in a dark place to realize change is possible. The author, Lucy Maud, Mon Lucy Maud Montgomery, is well known for the books like Anne of Green Gables. Her novels are famous because they can be enjoyed by children, but adults revisiting these stories see a deeper level of life. The Blue Castle is Montgomery's only adult novel. It's also the only novel that she wrote in the province of Ontario. She wrote it while living in the Muskoka region of central Ontario. And it's on the classic shelf at Indigo Chapters for a mere $6. So much of what is described in this character's life is relevant to so many clients I've helped. The novel starts with Valency Sterling. Valency lives in a small town town with the made-up name of Deerwood, with her widowed mother referred to as Mrs. Frederick and her mother's cousin, Cousin Stickles. So I just want to read part of how it starts. It's, it's just the power of Montgomery's writing is immense. If it had not rained on a certain May morning, Valencia Sterling's whole life would have been different. She would have gone with the rest of her clan to Aunt Wellington's engagement picnic, and Dr. Trent would have gone to Montreal. But it did rain. Valency wakened early in the lifeless, hopeless hour just preceding dawn. She had not slept well. One does not sleep well sometimes when one is 29 on the morrow and unmarried in a community and connection where the unmarried are simply those who have failed to get a man. She's even afraid to cry in case her red eyes cause her mother to interrogate her. She thinks of her mother's expression if she says she was crying because I cannot get married. And she can just imagine her mother's reaction. But her laughter had been was superficial. Presently, she lay there, a huddled, futile little figure, listening to the rain pouring down outside, watching with a sick distaste the chill, merciless light creeping into her ugly, sordid room. She doesn't dare change anything in her own bedroom because her mother and her aunt would, in her words, throw a fit in all of these rooms in this ugly house. The only thing she likes about her own bedroom is that she can be alone there at night to cry. She's not allowed to be in her room during the day. Her mother believed people who want to be alone have some sinister purpose. She's not allowed to change her hairstyle. Her hair is always worn up in an old fashioned style. She's not allowed to wear colorful or attractive clothes, even if she could have afforded them. And remember, this is a woman who's just turned 29, but she's afraid to do anything that would make her mother or her aunt angry. But ever since she was a child, she developed an amazing imaginary home, the Blue Castle in Spain. Everything wonderful and beautiful is in that castle. Only in her Blue Castle could she find temporary release.
And what struck me when I read this passage is so many of my clients escape from real life. They want to let go of pain. But on this morning of her day of fate, Valencia could not find the key to her blue castle. Reality pressed on her too hardly, barking at her heels like a maddening little dog. She was 29, lonely, undesired, ill-favored, the only homely girl in a handsome clan with no past and no future. As far as she could look back, life was drab and colorless, with not one single crimson or purple spot anywhere. As far as she could look forward, it seemed certain to be just the same until she was nothing but a solitary little withered leaf clinging to a wintry bough. The moment when a woman realizes she has nothing to live for, neither love, duty, purpose, nor hope, holds for her the bitterness of death. And I just have to go on living because I can't stop. And Valencia was in a kind of a panic. Her life it was a veritable nightmare. Very, very sad way to live. Only in her blue castle could she find temporary release. And now her imaginary blue castle just doesn't come to her. So she's glad it's raining and dreary because it means the annual picnic that's held every year to celebrate the engagement of her Aunt Wellington won't be held. It just happened that Valency's birthday is on the same day. But for her, this day, this veritable nightmare, even as a child, this day was not a celebration of her birthday. She was being taught that she, Valency was not special. And she knew that if the picnic went on at any gathering of her clan, she knew exactly what everyone would say to her. All of the comments would be negative and derogatory. And one of the worst is Uncle Benjamin, but he's rich. So all her life, she's been taught to cater to him in hopes he will leave her some money in his will. He likes to recount the story of Valencia getting into a jam jar when she was nine years old, a child who never had enough to eat, who never was allowed to eat jam at home, and they think it's a funny story. And 20 years later, they still recount that story at every clan occasion to show what a willful child she was. Instead of just accepting, it was an age-appropriate action. Uncle Benjamin repeats the same riddles on every occasion and expects Valencia to laugh happily. Valencia had heard him ask that riddle 50 times, and every time she wanted to throw something at him, but she never did. In the first place, the Sterlings, the extended clan, simply would not throw things. In the second place, Uncle Benjamin was a wealthy and childless old widower, and Valencia had been brought up in fear and admonition of his money. If she offended him, he could cut her out of his will, supposing that she was even in it. And Valencia did not want to be cut out of Uncle Benjamin's will. She had been poor all her life. She knew the galling bitterness of it. So she endured his riddles and even smiled, tortured little smiles. As part of the control, her mother, Mrs. Frederick, does not allow Valencia to read novels. But significantly, she is allowed to read nature books. And then only because the local librarian defended her choice, because her mother does not want her to read books that she enjoyed. Her mother's belief was, a book that is enjoyable is dangerous. So Valencia reads the single book she's allowed to get at the library every month, 
over and over until she can recite passages. Another part of her mother's control is that Valencia must always get up at 7.30 a.m. Her mother and her aunt only allow, they get up at seven and they only allow her an extra 30 minutes because she's delicate. All through her childhood, Valencia is frequently ill with bronchitis, with colds. And yet today she thinks, what is there to get up for? The room was bitterly cold. And it's a cold, wet May morning. So what was there to get up for? Another dreary day, like all the days that had preceded it, full of meaningless little tasks, joyless and unimportant, that benefited nobody. The room was bitterly cold with the raw, penetrating chill of a wet May morning. The house would be cold all day. It was one of Mrs. Frederick's rules that no fires were necessary after the 24th of May. And it just happened that her father caught a cold before he died. When Valencia was a year old, and it was thought that part of why he died was the cold that was in the house. Mrs. Frederick would not have a fire on the 20th of October. Fires could only start on the 21st. She lighted it the next day, but that was a day too late for Frederick Sterling, which shows the miserliness of her mother. Valencia is frequently ill. Her mother believes if a person makes up her mind not to have colds, she will not have colds. So Valencia is even made to believe that the illnesses that she suffers are her own fault. Her mother believes idleness is a cardinal sin. But on her 29th birthday, when the rain stops and Valencia timidly suggests getting a new book from the library, Mrs. Fredericks accuses her of wasting too much time reading. And Valencia thinks, well, what value is my time? Which means then, of what value am I? So if this is not enough, constant criticism, control, feeling she deserves to be treated this way. She has a cousin, Olive, who is perfect. In a rich family, she always has enough to eat. So she was healthy. She had pretty stylish clothes, colorful clothes. Her hair is in a modern style. Olive was taught that she was wonderful and that she deserves everything. There are a lot of scenes in the book about how Olive affected Valencia. Olive is a grade below Valencia in school. And of course, all the other students and the teachers love Olive. But there are two that really illustrate the pattern. In grade school, the girls collected buttons and their button collections would be showed off. Valencia had six beautiful pearl buttons that were from her grandmother's wedding dress. The pearls had been given to her. They gave Valencia status among all the other girls. And Olive wasn't happy about that. So Olive's mother then went to Valencia's mother and said it wasn't fair that Valencia had all the pearl buttons. Both girls were granddaughters. And Valencia's mother gave four of the six buttons to Olive. Not an equal split, the majority. So at that incident, at a young age, Valencia gave up. She accepted the belief that those who have get more and those who don't lose. It's a belief that my clients often cope with. I don't deserve more. The way things are will always be just like this. Nothing will ever change. Another childhood incident involved ice skates. Valencia had to borrow skates, which often didn't fit right. But even with the borrowed skates, she was graceful and she learns to skate 
better than her cousin who owns beautiful brand new skates. Valencia begs her rich uncle for skates for Christmas. He promises he will give her a pair for Christmas. Instead, she receives a pair of utilitarian galoshes, which are clunky boots that fit over a pair of shoes because they were more practical. This is another incident that reinforces Valencia's belief that she's not worthy. She doesn't matter. She's not good enough. She's always compared to Olive. Oh. Olive, who had been held up to her as a paragon of beauty, behavior, and success as long as she could remember. Why can't you hold yourself like Olive? Why can't you stand correctly like Olive? Why can't you speak prettily like Olive? Why can't you make an effort? Comments and treatment that are devastating for every, anyone. Words hurt. And why bother if there's no success? So going back to the beginning, her birthday, when she turns 29, she's afraid of crying. Not just because her mother will see her red eyes, but the crying might bring on another attack of the pain around her heart, a pain that increases her fear. So Valencia decides to see a doctor, but usually she has to go to a doctor who's part of the clan, who married an aunt. He lives in a different town. Someone has to take her. And then everyone in the family will know everything and talk about her. But Valencia doesn't want to know what, she doesn't want anyone to know about her heart. So she secretly takes money out of a bank account that her father set up for her when she was born. She's not allowed to touch it. So it's her first act of rebellion to sneak out money to pay a local doctor to find out about her heart pain. And it just happens he's an expert on heart. So it makes sense anyway. And while she's in the local doctor's waiting room, she reads a new book from the library, a nature book by her favorite author, John Foster. And she reads the paragraph that changed her life. Fear is the original sin, wrote John Foster. Almost all the evil in the world has its origin in the fact that someone is afraid of something. It is a cold, slimy serpent coiling about you. It is horrible to live with fear. And it is, of all things, degrading. Very relevant to today. And this was written, this was published in 1926. During the examination, the doctor receives a phone call. So right in the middle of her interacting with the doctor, he rushes out. And then without a word, he, she sees him rushing out of the, out of the house, the, the examination rooms in his house. And eventually the housekeeper comes and says, well, the doctor's son was in an accident and the doctor was called away to Montreal. So even the doctor who's paid to be with her, she's not important enough to be acknowledged. But knowing there was an emergency, Valencia thinks, well, it was a little less humiliating. But then the doctor sends her a letter. He apologizes for leaving so abruptly. He also gives the devastating news that Valencia has a heart condition. She only has at most a year to live, although she could collapse and die at any moment. And Valencia's thought is she made a discovery that surprised her. She who had been afraid of almost everything in life was not afraid of death. It was not, did not seem the least terrible to her. And she need not now be afraid of anything else. Why had she been afraid of things? Because of life. Afraid of Uncle Benjamin because of the menace of poverty and old age. But now she would never be old, neglected, tolerated. Afraid of being an old maid all her life. 
but now she would not be an old maid for very much longer. Afraid of offending her mother and her clan because she had to live with and among them and couldn't live peaceably if she didn't give in to them. But now she hadn't. Valency felt a curious sense of freedom. Rebellion flares up, not because she had no future, but because she had no past. But though she was not afraid of death, she was not indifferent to it. She found she resented it. It was not fair that she should have to die when she had never lived. Rebellion flared up in her soul as the dark hours passed, not because she had no future, but because she had no past. Even her mother had never loved her. She had not been so disappointed that she, well, Valency, was not born a boy. And Valency realizes nothing really pleasant had ever happened in her life. And she realizes, I've done so few bad things that they have to keep harping on the old ones. So she thinks about her life all night. She has these looping thoughts. She stews about her life. She reviews her whole life. Through that sleepless night, she thinks about all the times she was laughed at or put down or even made to apologize for, to Olive for things she hadn't even done. The injustice of it burned in her soul tonight. And so Valencia transforms her life. She finds her voice. She starts speaking up. She starts speaking back. She stops being so afraid. And the ultimate rebellion to her mother and her clan, she chooses to leave home. She chooses to go live as a housekeeper to help care for a former classmate who is dying of cancer. And the clan is up in arms because this classmate, Sissy Gay, had gone to work at a resort one summer and she came home pregnant. And her widowed father, Abel, the local handyman, who's also the town drunk, didn't turn her out as a sinner the way the community thought he should. And even when Sissy's infant died, the community was unforgiving and cruel. She had a child out of wedlock and she stayed in the community. And in spite of the negative reaction Valencia knows will happen for going to help Sissy, Valencia leaves home. And when Uncle Benjamin berates Valencia's mother, you should have been stricter with her when she was young, her mother truthfully says, I don't see how I could have been. For the first time in her life, Valencia is needed. She is appreciated. For the first time, she has plenty of food to eat. She's allowed to go outside. She's even paid a wage so that she has money of her own. She blossoms. She thrives. Her time with Sissy is significant. Helping her friend in the last stages of her life takes Valencia out of herself. It changes her life. Valencia held Sissy close. She was suddenly happy. Here was someone who needed her, someone she could help. She was no longer a superfluity. All things had passed away. Everything had become new. To be a superfluity in your own life. But the best part of living in this other house is there will be no ice cold maternal tantrums to endure. When Sissy dies of cancer, Valencia is commended for her poise and competence as she hosts the wake. Inside, she's furious. 
these hypocrites, they would not acknowledge Sissy while she was alive. They would even cross the street if she was in town rather than greet her. Mrs. Frederick and the clan are secretly happy. They think Valencia will not have a choice now, that she will have to return and life will get back to normal. Instead, Valencia takes her life into her own hands. She decides to change her life again. She asks a man to marry her. Barney, who's been a friend to Sissy and Abel, but he's known to the community as a notorious, disreputable man who, who travels all over in this car that makes lots of noise. He's often drunk. And he's even rumored to be an escaped murderer. But she asks him to marry her. In an earlier passage, when he was driving past her on the road, Valencia had realized this outlaw was happy, whatever he was or wasn't. And she, Valencia Sterling, respectable, well-behaved to the last degree, was unhappy and had always been unhappy. Valencia even shows Barney the doctor's letter to show that she only has a short time to live, to reassure him he won't be burdened with her for very long. And then the novel becomes a fairy tale. It's lovely. His cabin on an isolated island, which is called Up Back in the, in the, the wilderness, as they motor up to it, it looks to her like her blue castle with the blue mists of sunset surrounding the cabin and the fir trees taking the place of the castle turrets. Montgomery explores the changes in Valencia's life and thoughts as she transforms into a healthy, beautiful woman with modern hair style, stylish clothes that fit her. The details of how Valencia's inner life transform are inspirational. Valencia learns to paddle her own canoe. She never got sick. But these observable outside changes simply reflect all the changes happening inside her. Her thoughts, Valencia's thoughts, transform her life. Valencia even comes to realize that her perfect cousin is like a dewless morning. There is something lacking, some inner spiritual strength. Valencia spends a lot of time with her husband outside, exploring a beautiful wilderness, which allows Montgomery's powerful prose to detail the wonderful scenes of Muskoka in central Ontario. And many passages sound like the group of seven painting given words. And I'm just going to, to share some pictures which are iconic Canadian images. But it's almost like Montgomery saw these paintings and decided to share them. There. Okay. Oh, so this image every Canadian would recognize it. The lemon-hued twilight air, this jack pine. <laughs> and another one, lemon-hued twilight air and the, tw and the purple shadows of the hills. And the description, I'd never heard sunset described as amber before, but it's a perfect description, purple and amber. So this painting from 1922, about the same time, and probably not far from where Montgomery lived. So whether Montgomery ever saw any of these paintings, I mean, travel wasn't so easy back then. Uh, another one, purple hues, the sky of purple and amber. And several passages she talks about, you know, sitting outside with Arnie and watching the amazing, beautiful northern lights. And another um, passage, there was a group of islets far off to the west. At sunrise, they looked like a cluster of emeralds. At sunset, they looked like a cluster of amethysts. The red, the brilliant crimson red of October. 
And there was a wonderful phrase. Uh, October with a gorgeous pageant of color around Mitawis, into which Valency plunged her soul. Never had she imagined anything so splendid, a great tinted piece, blue wind winnowed skies, sunlight sleeping in the glades of that fairyland, long dreamy purple days paddling idly with their canoe along the shores. And again, the goals are, are so incredible. Up the rivers of crimson and gold, a sleepy red hunter's moon, enchanted tempests that stripped the leaves from the trees and heaped them along the shores, flying shadows of clouds. And, you know, this one about the beaver dam, there's also a description of in the book uh, about this a beaver dam that they explore and how it affected the, the wilderness around them and, and just looking at the beavers and, and appreciating the nature. Uh, this kind of windswept pines, very typical of some of the trees around there. And uh, the winter, December, early snow and Orion, the pale fires of the Milky Way. It was really winter now, wonderful, cold, starry winter. How Valency had always hated winter. Dull, brief, uneventful days, long, cold, companionless nights, cousin stickles with her back that had to be rubbed continually. Cousin stickles whining over the price of coal. Endless colds and bronchitis or the dread of being sick. Red ferns, liniment and purple pills. But now she loved winter. Winter was beautiful up back, almost intolerably beautiful. Days of clear brilliance, evenings that were like cups of glamour, the purest vintage of winter's wine, nights with their fire of stars, cold, exquisite winter sunrises, lovely ferns of ice all over the window of the blue castle. Moonlight on birches in the silver thaw, ragged shadows on windy evenings, torn, twisted, fantastic shadows, great silences. It's amazing how silent a winter day is when the snow absorbs every sound. Great silences, austere and searching, jeweled, barbaric hills. The sun suddenly breaking through gray clouds over long white mist wisps, ice gray twilights broken by snow squalls when their cozy living room with its goblins of firelight and inscrutable cats seemed cozier, cozier than ever. Every hour brought a new revelation and wonder. Anyway, I... Uh, the prose, the words of, of Montgomery are amazing. And then there was one more phrase um, that I, one more paragraph I really, really was impressed with. Um, All the tintings of winter woods are extremely delicate and elusive. When the brief afternoon wanes and the sun just touches the tops of the hills, there seems to be all over the woods and an abundance, not of color, but the spirit of color. There's really nothing but pure white after all, but one has the impression of fairy light blendings of rose and violet, opal and heliotrope on the slopes of the dingles and along the curves of the forest land. You feel sure the tint is there, but when you look at it directly, it's gone. From the corner of your eye, you are aware that it is lurking over yonder, in a spot where there's nothing but pale purity a moment ago. Or just when the sun is setting, it's there, a fleeting moment of real color. And then the red streams out over the snow and incarnates the hills and the rivers and smites the crest of the pines with flame. Just a few minutes of transfiguration and revelation, and then it's gone. It's a very powerful book. 
I, I'm a very fast reader and Diane told me I had to slow down. So part of slowing it down was I highlighted the book. As a former librarian, highlighting text in a book is like verbatim, you know, taboo. Uh, it helped me, but it also helped when I decided to, to do a, a, a commentary about to, re, to really highlight the pages that I was impressed with. So anyway, it's, it's on the classic shelf at, um, at uh, Indigo Chapters. Uh, it's a fascinating book and it's so relevant for anyone who's dealing with being in a dark place to know it doesn't have to be that way. You can change, you can change your thoughts. And uh, I, I was going to give some summary of, of clients I've helped, but I've taken too long to do this. So I'll do that in another video, but having someone help you to change your thoughts, your thoughts control your emotions, your emotion controls your actions, your actions control your events, your life. It's a saying presented by Marissa Peer, but it's so relevant. So uh, anyway, I, I hope if you're interested, you'll maybe read this book and, and take what you can from it. And uh, so this is the end of what I was going to say about the book. And I just want to take a, a moment to, to thank Diane. Um, as I was writing this, there were a lot of times where I wasn't sure, are these words Diane's or are they mine? Because she was so excited about this book. It's one of her favorites. I'd never read it before. Diane and I met in a midwifery class decades ago. Our daughters were born six days apart. They're even still you know, friends. And through all these years, I've, I so appreciate her encouragement, her support, her, her, her just being there. All the many meals that we've shared together, all the activities. Recently, she's encouraged me to go swimming. Uh, we used to go swimming all the time together with our children, with toddlers, taking our children to the children's museum, taking them to the soccer games, taking them to the baseball games, just having fun. And in recent years, when I changed my career so, so much, um, Diane and her husband, Gary, were a wonderful sounding board. You know, should I go to England? This is crazy. And when I've, you know, they never said what I should think. They just encouraged me to think the pros and the cons and what do I want to do? And when I did make the decision, they were encouraging. When I became certified, they were supportive. They, they both were willing to be guinea pigs to let me practice on them. And a session I had for Gary for his golf game was so much fun. They celebrate with me the stories of success I have with clients. They commiserate with me the stories for clients who, who don't do so well. I, uh, Anyway, Diane and Gary, I just wanted to say I am so grateful for your love, for your support, for your, your just being there. I'm so grateful to you for everything. And uh, Diane, this book was a great read. Anyway, so for everyone else who's listening, thank you for listening. And, and I hope you'll uh, appreciate this book, The Blue Castle by Lucy Maud Montgomery, the famous author of the Anne of Green Gables series.